Hello, I'm Cheryl McKenzie. Tonight, an APTN Investigates special report. The third season of APTN Investigates actually begins on January 6th, but this is a story we wanted to bring you now. Last summer, reporter Kathleen Martins interviewed former students of residential schools involved in a legal process to get compensation for physical and sexual abuse they experienced in the schools. She discovered there are some problems in the system. We are sorry. There, he said it. To the approximately 80,000 living former students and all family members and communities, the government of Canada now recognizes that it was wrong. Prime Minister Stephen Harper accepted responsibility for the government's role in the Indian residential school abuse scandal in 2008. Far too often, these institutions gave rise to abuse or neglect and were inadequately controlled. And we apologize for failing to protect you. His apology was one of several ways the government and churches who ran the schools were trying to reconcile with former students. They also coughed up money for compensation, one payment for all students, and additional cash for survivors of sexual and the worst physical abuse. One of those survivors is Annie Plume. She says she was repeatedly physically abused for 10 years at the St. Paul Residential School near her home on the Blood Reserve in southern Alberta. Today she is in frail health in her 80s, relying on her son Tyrone Weaselhead to translate our questions into her Blackfoot language. Annie is deaf in one ear and lost the use of a finger after her injuries weren't treated. Every day, every day, her hair getting pulled. She was slammed on the ground, kicked. Her ordeal at St. Uh, Paul's was just a one scary ordeal for a little five-year-old girl to go there and, you know, they promised her protection, they promised her education, they promised this, they promised that. I think every one of those promises were broken. Annie says her parents didn't want her to go, but when the police officers showed up, they had no choice. They had to. Yes, my dad is going to go to the gym if I don't go to school. Annie says her parents consoled themselves with the belief she was learning and safe, but in reality she was a terrified little girl doing housework in the basement. Children as young as five, like Annie Plume, were taken from their families and brought here, but not all of them attended classes. Many were forced to be laborers washing bedding in the laundry room. Do you know why you were treated like that? I don't know why she felt was in a bad kid at the school. Tyrone says his mother, who raised seven children alone after her husband died of cancer, was unable to find work due to her injuries and lack of education. We made you cry. I thought we were going to make her cry. Oh, because of what she went through, the love she gave us. He says his mother was anxious yet determined to meet the adjudicator in a room like this one in nearby Cardston, Alberta. It's the adjudicator's job to decide how much compensation Annie deserved. It's her lawyer's job to prepare her for the adjudicator's questions and attend the hearing. That's how the rules are spelled out under the independent assessment process of the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement. Survivors get compensated and their lawyers receive 15% of the payout as their fee from the government. And lawyers can negotiate even more pay, up to 15% more directly from their clients. Lawyer Daniel Ish is the chief adjudicator in charge of 110 junior adjudicators across Canada. He also keeps an eye on about 200 lawyers working on compensation cases. Some lawyers work just for Canada's contribution right so they would never take any money from the claimant mm -hmm. others um, uh, enter into a contingency fee agreement for an amount more than 15 percent mm -hmm. the average the maximum they can do is uh, another 15 percent that's by court order um, the average is about 20 21 percent in total mm -hmm. so that's five or six percent would come from the claimant he says lawyers fees were capped for a reason they wanted to try make sure that there weren't gross um, uh, charges being put to, put to clients. They saw obviously. a potential yeah. for abuse. Yeah, of okay. course, yeah. Turns out unethical and even unlawful practices have already occurred. 
Ish confirms this in an internal memo last June obtained by APTN. He cites lawyers not preparing clients beforehand, not meeting clients until the day of their hearings, not filling out forms correctly, wrongly using third parties, and twice meeting with the wrong clients. How do you see yourself? Who are you advocating for? Or Nobody. I'm the neutral. I'm the judge, okay? I'm not advocating for everybody. Except for on legal fees, I've got more involved in that. The claimant has a responsibility to make out the claim. We have a responsibility to make sure the process operates properly and the rules are applied. Okay. Tyrone says his mother didn't meet her lawyer until the day of the hearing, and it was a woman instead of the man she had signed with. Did you have a lawyer? Well, that lawyer that um, to check against. Blot, David Blot. Yeah, David Blot as a lawyer, but there was an, another lawyer that represented her. It wasn't Blot, uh, well, David. There was a, a, a firm, yeah, probably from the firm. Tyrone's sister took Annie to meet the adjudicator, but Tyrone says the adjudicator told her she couldn't be the translator, and Annie's lawyer didn't object. She never even got a chance to explain her story. Did you say, no, Annie, that's not applicable or whatever. And so she just, she felt intimidated. She felt like, well, maybe that's what students were supposed to go through. Annie, did your lawyer help you? Grace promote me to I don't think so. Don't think so, Madam. No, oh, I didn't help her at all. Annie was refused compensation, but her family believes she has grounds to appeal that decision. After her meeting, they gave, I think, a blot gave us all a, uh, they gave us all a letter stating we have a right to interpret her. APTN investigates wanted to speak with lawyer David Blot and reached him by phone, but he refused to do an on-camera interview. We went to his Calgary office anyway, and his home. No answer. Daniel Ish says Blot and Company represents 3,000 residential school survivors seeking compensation on the prairies. Many of those clients come from the Blood Tribe in southern Alberta, says Chief Charles Weaselhead. He has about 2,500 living residential school survivors in his community of 6,000. It's a dark history in, uh, in our past, you know, both for uh, the government, uh, both for the uh, churches, you know, that. Uh, operated the uh, residential schools on behalf of the uh, government. Weaselhead had high hopes the court-approved compensation process would help the healing process. Part of the uh, journey for the majority of us is to really understand, you know, why we are like today. And once we begin to identify, you know, that uh, position, you know, perhaps uh, we can begin to understand why some of us uh, uh, fell into alcoholism, in, into addictions, you know, have nightmares kind of, uh, uh, all the time uh, type of thing, why we are like this to our spouses, to our children, you know, uh, all, all kinds of uh, uh, patterns of behaviors. He was angry when he heard what happened to his auntie, Annie Plume. She went in there, they refused a translator to come in with her. They refused uh, some kind of support, you know, person to be with her, whether it was one of her children or one of uh, a person that she trusts, you know, that she would be in there with, you know. So I, I'm assuming, you know, that uh, when the uh, process of uh, telling her story began, that she just come completely locked up, clamped up. It wasn't the first time Weaselhead heard about screw-ups. He wrote to Daniel Ish and Assembly of First Nations National Chief Sean Atlio months earlier, saying the effect of the possibility of mishandling of these applications is twofold. First, individual claimants may not be receiving the financial compensation to which they are entitled. Second, claimants, many of whom suffer from disadvantages, are not being heard in the assessment process and there is thus no real healing for them through the IAP. Weaselhead went further when he sat down with APTN investigates. It le leads you to believe, you know, that uh, that perhaps a certain fir firm has stockpiled as too many clients uh, as well. When we return from the break, we'll show you more about how the IAP is working and who's involved with it.